for the next uh, hour, I want to look at the uh, third form of uh, British and American analytic philosophy. This is called uh, ordinary language philosophy. Uh, so we've talked about logical atomism, we've talked about logical positivism, and now we're talking thirdly about ordinary language philosophy. This uh, ordinary language philosophy is connected uh, with the name of Wittgenstein. We talked about Wittgenstein's early work. We talked about his Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. And uh, now uh, Wittgenstein, remember, he has been absent. Uh, when the cat's away, the mice will play, right? And the uh, positivists came along and kind of developed their own uh, hyper-scientific version of the Tractatus, but uh, that uh, version fell apart just as the Tractatus had fallen apart. So, uh, and Wittgenstein uh, was never a logical positivist. He just probably watched what was going on with some bemusement. And then uh, he comes back to philosophy. And there's an interesting story about how that happened, and I, I'm not going to go into that uh, with you here. But in 1929, uh, Wittgenstein returned to philosophy after some years of silence. Uh, he had been rethinking the ideas of the Tractatus, and after a few years, he uh, developed some rather different approaches, and these different approaches are what we refer to when we speak of the late Wittgenstein. Most of Wittgenstein's writings after 1930 reflect this new approach. The standard work is the Philosophical Investigations. This is a book that was not published until after Wittgenstein's death, and he did not complete it. Uh, uh, there are pa parts of it that he wrote, and, and then there are all these little sayings that he uh, uh, kept in shoeboxes and whatever, and uh, it's not clear. It's kind of like Pascal's Pensees. You don't know quite uh, where all the sayings were supposed to fit in the connected argument, but the editors have made their best judgments, and so you can go out and buy a copy of the philosophical investigations that has all these sayings in it, but uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like Pascal's Pensees. Some of the, it's all uh, kind of disconnected sayings, uh, uh, numbered one, two, three, four, five, and uh, uh, some of them are only two or three lines long, some of them are maybe one line long, some of them go on for several pages. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is interesting, but the, the earliest uh, uh, indication of the late Wittgenstein is a collection of books called the, the Blue and Brown Books. These were lectures that he delivered to his students about 1933-34 or so. Uh, and if you're interested in uh, learning more about Wittgenstein's later work, would probably be best for you to begin by reading the Blue and Brown books. Uh, philosophical Investigations is more definitive, but, uh, uh, but it's harder to read because uh, of all the, the confusion, uh, all the little, little sayings, and you don't know where it goes, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and a lot of it is very peculiar in the language it uses. But the, in the blue and brown books, uh, uh, Wittgenstein is speaking in full sentences, and, uh, and perhaps his students contributed something to the formulation too. So uh, uh, these are student notes. Uh, uh, I hope that uh, after I'm gone, they don't uh, uh, try to judge my thinking too much from the notes that my students take, but uh, uh, that's why I've tried hard to get a lot of my ideas on uh, in, in print. But, uh, but anyway, student notes uh, do have a certain value. I think they have a particular value here when we're talking about a rather enigmatic figure like Wittgenstein. You see the names of some of uh, his disciples in this later stage, uh, uh, Gilbert Ryle, P.F. Strawson, uh, Norman Malcolm, uh, uh, Weissmann, I forget his first name, uh, Paul Homer, who was one of my teachers, uh, J.L. Austin, uh, 
J.O. Urmson, uh, and others. Uh, all right, uh, the later Wittgenstein, some of his emphases. First of all, Wittgenstein, uh, uh, in his early work, remember, tried to reduce language to having one use and one use only. The, the use of language in Wittgenstein's Tractatus is to picture the world so that uh, uh, in language you uh, have one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to state facts. Now, I, I remarked that that's kind of a peculiar view, granted the richness of language, and Wittgenstein came to see that also. Uh, Wittgenstein came in his later work to see that language has a wide variety of uses, not just picturing facts or stating facts, but uh, uh, not just conveying propositional information, but a whole long list of things. There's one, uh, one saying in the, pro in the philosophical investigations where he gives a real long list of uses of language, including uh, pr promising, thanking, cursing, praying, joking, greeting, pretending, uh, and so on. And he came to see that all these uses are mutually irreducible. You can't, uh, uh, you can't uh, reduce them to the function of stating facts. Uh, each of them has its unique role to play in language. Each of them, none of them can be replaced by any of the others. So to understand language is a much more difficult job than uh, either Wittgenstein or the, or the logical positivists had thought earlier in the century. So, uh, B, there's little point in stigmatizing some language as in some sense meaningless because it fails to picture facts or convey verifiable information. Uh, see, that's what Wittgenstein did in the Tractatus. He tried to say, you know, there's some language that's meaningless because it can't be put into the perfect language. Well, now he just says, uh, uh, you know, don't call it meaningless, just, just recognize that uh, uh, there are different kinds of language that have different purposes. And the positivists were wrong too. They were trying to identify some language as cognitively meaningless. But their idea was, was also that the only function of language is to state facts. Uh, now Wittgenstein says, no, that, that's, that's silly. Uh, there's so many different things that are done by language, and they're all meaningful. It's meaningful to state facts. It's also meaningful to make promises and tell jokes and ask questions and give commands and so on and so forth. So uh, the new thinking of Wittgenstein uh, rejects now the notion of a perfect language, which is such an important idea uh, to the Tractatus. Now Wittgenstein says that there is no language that is perfect for all purposes. Let me get this. There's no language that's perfect for all purposes. Some language is perfect for some things, uh, but not perfect for other things. And some, to, some language, of course, is imperfect for everything, but that uh, would take us too far afield. Um, D, in general, the meaning of language this is what we've been talking about for this whole century. <laughs> uh, what is the meaning of language? How does language come to mean? You know, that's an interesting problem, you know. Language we, are, are marks on a page, right? Or sounds that go through the air. And yet somehow these particular sounds and these particular marks uh, convey meaning to us. So how does that happen? How do words acquire meaning. Uh, in the earlier part of the century, uh, Wittgenstein and the positivists thought that language has meaning by referring, uh, kind of like there, there is a hook between a sentence and a fact. But uh, in this later period, uh, what Wittgenstein says is that the meaning of language in general, now the term meaning can be used in many ways, but uh, and usually when we're asking what do we mean by meaning, okay, uh, usually when we ask what is the meaning of language, we're referring to the use 
of language. In general, the meaning of language is its use. Uh, all language is meaningful if it has a legitimate use among some groups of people. Okay, so this is kind of a pragmatic view. We, we uh, use language for, for a purpose. Uh, Wittgenstein uh, used examples like this. When, when I'm on a construction site, uh, I'm the foreman, and I say slab. And what I mean is that he should, he should pick up a slab and brings it to me, and, uh, and I do something with it. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a transaction, you might say, that, that uses language, all right? And Wittgenstein says that's a language game, all right? It's a human practice in which we use words. And what about the word slab there? Uh, does the word slab refer to a, one of the slabs on the ground? Well, maybe there's an element of that in it, but uh, actually, no. I mean, a, a slab is sort of simply a way of starting this game. It's a way of uh, starting this exchange, this transaction. It signals the other person that he is to pick up a slab and bring it over. Okay, it's not just a noun. It's a, it's a, uh, there's something in it of a command. There's something in it of, like, play ball. It says, let's, let's do this thing that we're supposed to do. So uh, uh, language has that uh, kind of uh, thing, too. So language has a use. And now Wittgenstein is prepared to be very generous about the meaningfulness of language, whereas uh, he used to say, and the positivists used to say, that metaphysical language is meaningless, well, the, the, the later Wittgenstein doesn't say that at all. He says if the uh, uh, metaphysical language uh, is useful for people, if it has a use, then it's meaningful. Same for ethical language, same for religious language, same for any kind of language that's uh, uh, problematic. Uh, now, uh, there are a number of things that... Uh, he talked about in the Tractatus that he no longer uh, deals with. For one thing, he, he no longer thinks that there's any need to uh, translate uh, uh, complex sentences into simple sentences or to uh, reduce vague language to more precise language. Now, you do those things when you're trying to come up with a perfect language, but Wittgenstein isn't trying to do that anymore. Uh, you, there's no need to make language absolutely precise. Uh, let's say I'm in a photographer's studio, and the photographer tells me, stand roughly there. This is Wittgenstein's illustration. Uh, and I go, and I stand more or less where the photographer tells me to stand. Now, that's, that's a legitimate language game. That's a language transaction. That's using language in terms of a human... Uh, human uh, uh, transaction for a human purpose. Uh, what does that mean, you know? I mean, you, you might say, well, that's imprecise to say stand roughly there. Shouldn't the photographer be more precise than that? Shouldn't he say, all right, stand eight inches from the wall uh, uh, or, or draw a square around me to tell me uh, the, the exact limits of where I could stand and where I couldn't stand? Well, he might do that on some occasions, but uh, that's not the purpose uh, of the command that he gives me, not to tell me precisely where to stand, but to tell me approximately where to stand. And that's okay. There's a lot of human language that's not designed to be precise and in which precision is unnecessary. Uh, if you ask me my age, and I tell you uh, I'm 73, uh, 73 years, uh, three months, uh, uh, so many days, so many hours, uh, minutes, seconds. Uh, by the time I get down to milliseconds and nanoseconds, uh, uh, you're bored to death, and I haven't communicated anything to you. And besides, uh, while I've been doing that, some more milliseconds have passed, and so uh, uh it's impossible to give my age down to the nanosecond. Uh, but uh, you see, the, that, that's just a, 
a game that we play. You ask my age, I give you a number. And we know what uh, that means, we know how it's done, and we don't expect absolute precision. Uh, we know that uh, in, uh, our, uh, in our uh, work that uh, uh, only a certain amount of precision is necessary. I think that's a very good observation on Wittgenstein's part. Uh, I've often used that illustration when we're talking about biblical inerrancy. Uh, the Bible does claim, I think, to be the Word of God and therefore to be inerrant because God doesn't make mistakes. Uh, so the Bible is the inerrant Word of God, but the, there's nothing that tells us that the Bible is absolutely precise. The Bible is without error, but the Bible is not always precise. The Bible sometimes speaks in approximations. Uh, the Bible sometimes uses round numbers. Uh, the Bible sometimes gives you the general gist of something that happened rather than telling you every detail. And that's because the Bible is ordinary language for the most part. Uh, the Bible uses language that we speak every day rather than some technical kind of language that only uh, scientists uh, uh, could understand. So uh, I, I think that uh, Wittgenstein is, uh, makes a good point here and, and makes a number of good points in this uh, analysis of language. People sometimes say that the uh, frame is influenced by Wittgenstein, and I guess there's some uh, ways in which I've learned from him, and uh, I think we all can learn from him. That doesn't mean that I accept his philosophy, and I don't accept his philosophy, and I'll be giving you some crit criticisms of it uh, uh, before too long. Another interesting thing about Wittgenstein's new uh, view uh, is uh, under F there, he's critical of generalizations. Uh, when, when, we talk, when we use general terms, like uh, the term flower, or the term man, or the term uh, dog, uh, we're not referring to a particular dog, we're not referring to a particular man, we're not, uh, we use terms that are general. And remember, those were terribly important to Plato. For Plato, uh, general terms had to have reference. They had to refer to something, and what they refer to, of course, is in the world of forms. But every philosopher has to deal with this. What, what do we do about uh, generalizations? Uh, is, is there something uh, that every man has in common that justifies the use of the general term man? All right? And this leads you to the question of essence. What is the essence of a man? What is it that you have to have in order to be a man? And Aristotle said uh, you have to be a rational animal. <laughs> the Bible says you have to be the image of God. Uh, other people have made different suggestions. But Wittgenstein has a problem with this idea of essence, with this idea that uh, every flower has to have something uh, uh, in common with every other flower in order to justify the use of a single term flower uh, to talk about all of them. Uh, Wittgenstein says sometimes there is no common quality. Now take the term game, for instance. What is the essence of a game? What is a game, really? We know there are all kinds of different games. There, there are ball games, there are board games, there are video games. Uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what is it? Is there something that all games have in common? And Wittgenstein examines some possibilities. He says, well, uh, maybe a game is, uh, is, a, is an activity where there's winning and losing. Uh, but that's not true. I mean, take Ring Around the Rosie. <laughs> the kids are just dancing around the circle and then they fall down. Nobody wins, nobody loses. So, but that's a game, we say, okay? Well, let's try this. Uh, say a game is something that we pursue for the fun of it uh, and not for anything else. Well, that's true of a lot of games. But take professional baseball or professional football. <laughs> Uh, the players there may be having fun, but they're doing it for money, okay? <laughs> it's an economic venture. 
Uh, well, what is it then that, that every single game has in common? What, what is the essence of games? And Wittgenstein's answer is uh, there, there may be no essence, okay? There may be no form, all right? There may be no essence. It may be kind of like a family reunion, all right? Let's say all the Joneses get together. Well, that would be too, too many people. Uh, let's, uh, let's say uh, the Richmonds get together and uh, have a family reunion some, uh, uh, over some weekend, and you take a picture of the family gathered together. Well, you'll notice that some of them have the Richmond nose. Uh, some of them have what might be called the Richmond ears. But not everybody does because, of course, uh, uh, spouses from outside the family, of course, have come in, and, and so the genes get all mixed up and twisted. And, but, but there's still kind of a resemblance, you know. Uh, you, you look at the picture and you say, well, there's kind of a similarity that these people have, at least the ones that are connected by blood. They, they have a certain similarity, a certain likelihood but it's not the same in every single Richmond. You know, there, somebody might have the Richmond nose, but not the Richmond ears. Uh, some of them may have the Richmond uh, musical talent, and some may not, but may have something else. So the, 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 there are common qualities, but they're not always present everywhere. They overlap, and they crisscross, and they get uh, modified. Uh, Wittgenstein speaks of this as a family resemblance. And he uses this, it's become a very, very uh, well-known way of speaking about similarities and likenesses between things. That uh, uh, this, is, this is the way it is with flowers. Flowers have family resemblances. Flowers, of course, are very different. There's a lot of difference between a sunflower and a, and a buttercup flower, but, uh, uh, but uh, there, there are similarities. Uh, uh, not every flower uh, has the, the same, it has a particular similarity, uh, but there, there are enough, there's enough commonness there that the qualities overlap and crisscross and, uh, and so on. Uh, that's known as the family resemblance idea, and that's important because it, uh, it deals with the philosophical problem of universals and particulars. And Wittgenstein is basically saying there is no such thing as an absolute universal. And, uh, you know, that, that's worth exploring. Um, arguably, a Christian position is that because God is one and many, uh, in God there's no oneness without manyness, and there's no manyness without oneness, so in the world, there's no universality without particularity, and there's no particularity without universality. Well, think about that a little bit, uh, as Steve Brown would say. Now, uh, uh, what does Wittgenstein think in his later years about philosophy itself? Now, this was a problem, you may recall, in the Tractatus. Uh, 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 Wittgenstein came to the conclusion that uh, uh, the Tractatus refuted itself. Here the Tractatus is supposed to be philosophy. Uh, it's supposed to show you the relationship between language and reality. But basically it refuted itself. And Wittgenstein came to the conclusion that uh, that's all philosophy was. That if the Tractatus refuted itself, and philosophy... Uh, uh, must not be much worth pursuing. But in the second phase, uh, he came up with uh, valuable functions uh, for philosophy. He still opposes metaphysics. Uh, he still says that philosophers have no access to facts that are unavailable to other disciplines. Uh, he, he, uh, kind of, uh, he sees metaphysics as a kind of philosophical illness. A uh, very famous uh, illustration of this, uh, he uh, begins the, the philosophical investigations with a quote from Augustine about time. Uh, Augustine says, uh, uh, quid est tempus, you know? Uh, what is time? Uh, if nobody asks me, I know. 
If somebody asks me, I don't know. Now, Wittgenstein used this as an example of the development of a metaphysical concept. Think about time for just a minute. Uh, I ask you what time it is, and you look at the clock on the wall, and you tell me it's 1025. In fact, it actually is about 1025 as I give this lecture. Uh, that's a language game that we play with the term time. And there's no mystery about that. We all know what to do. When I say, what time is it? You look at your watch, or you look at your cell phone, or you look at the clock in the back, and you reply to me. And uh, there's nothing mysterious about that. But let's say uh, you say, all right, uh, Professor Frame, it's uh, 1025. And I say, well, you're sure that's the time? And you say, yes, that's the time. And I say, well, how do you, uh, what is time, <laughs> okay? What is time? Now I'm sounding like a philosopher. Uh, what is the essence of time? What is time really, all right? And then you start scratching your heads. You know how to play the game, but you don't know how to play the game of definition. Uh, maybe you studied uh, time in your physics class, and you can give me a scientific definition, but of course that scientific definition is pretty far removed from the way we use the term time in uh, ordinary language. But Wittgenstein says, look, uh, philosophers have come up with all kinds of metaphysical definitions for time as if those metaphysical definitions uh, tell us the essence of time or tell us what time really is. And Wittgenstein says, no, that's, that's bogus. Uh, that's uh, illegitimate. Uh, we know what time means if we can play the game, all right? Uh, there's that game, there's some other games too that are connected with the word time. And if we can play those games, we can use the term. And meaning is use. Use is all that there is. If we can play that game, uh, we know the use, we know the meaning. And uh, so there, there is no essence. The, the, the question about essence uh, is a metaphysical question. And the job of the philosopher is not to come up with an answer to the question, what is the essence of time? Uh, the job of the philosopher is to keep people from asking questions like that. The job of the philosopher is therapeutic. Uh, the habit of, uh, of asking what's the essence of something, that's like a disease. And uh, the philosopher is the, uh, is the, is the physician uh, of the soul. Uh, and the philosopher is to, to help people get out uh, of that confusion. Uh, uh, one, one point, uh, Wittgenstein said the job of the philosopher is to show the fly the way out of the fly bottle. Uh, and uh, so he, he described the uh, philosophy as having a therapeutic function. The work is to cure people of the confusions that they have uh, and, and, uh, uh, and let them get back to using words as they're properly intended to, uh, uh, to be used. Now, this is not all that obvious. Wittgenstein mainly saw philosophy this way, as negative and therapeutic. Uh, the work of philosophy is to cure misconceptions, not to discover new facts. But he also said at one point that once the confusion is cleared away, then we see the world rightly. So that suggests a more positive function of philosophy, namely analyzing language and use to determine what the world is really like, to be able to see the world rightly. And this is uh, some of Wittgenstein's disciples took this more positive line. Uh, Strawson wrote a book uh, uh, called uh, Individuals, uh, an essay in descriptive metaphysics. Okay, and so once we understand how words are used, then we understand what the world is really like, and we can call that our metaphysic. Well, all very interesting, but now what about religion? We're still here at Reformed Theological Seminary, and we want to ask questions about religion. 
And you remember that both in the Tractatus and in Logical Positivism, it was thought that religious language was very problematic, either cognitively meaningless or perhaps uh, 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 mystical or uh, perhaps emotive, to use the positivist's grab bag. Uh, they had little respect for religious language, although they tried to find some role for it to play. Uh, now, what the role does, what's Wittgenstein's uh, view of religious language moving into his second phase? Well, religious language, he says, is a peculiar use of language that's found among certain groups of people. Uh, they use it for transactions, they use it for language games, and therefore religious language in general is, is meaningful. But, says Wittgenstein, uh, it has to be used <coughs> in the proper way. Now, you see, Wittgenstein is, uh, seems to be wide open here. Uh, he seems to be saying, all right, if it's useful, then use it. <laughs> you know, if it has a use, then, then go ahead. But uh, he's also, as a philosopher, he's, he's trying to determine what the proper uh, use of a term is. And so uh, when, when we ask uh, uh, the uh, meaning of time, uh, the proper way is to simply play the game. Uh, the improper way is to ask what the essence of it is and to treat time as a metaphysical object. So uh, even though Wittgenstein seems wide open and emphasizing our freedom and, and so on, he does close off alternatives uh, fairly regularly. And that's what he does with religious language as well. He says that whatever religious language is, it is not scientific language, and it has to be distinguished sharply from scientific language. How is it different from scientific language? Well, for one thing, uh, scientific language usually claims uh, only uh, probability or possibility, that some, some things are probable or possible. This is not... Of course, when you're talking E equals MC squared, scientists usually say that's certain. But even there, of course, they, they allow for the possibility that experiment could uh, lead to a change or modification. But in religion, uh, Wittgenstein says that uh, people are always claiming certainty, all right? That's kind of odd. Uh, why is it that uh, religious people uh, are so certain that God exists, or so certain that Jesus is the Son of God, or that Jesus died for our sins. Uh, well, Christians offer reasons for their statements. They say, look, in the, the Bible says this and that, and there's this historical evidence, and so on and so forth. But that doesn't uh, impress Wittgenstein very much. Uh, Wittgenstein says that the uh, uh, religious people uh, use these evidences for, uh, to make them bear more weight than they really ought to bear. Uh, uh, religious people claim a higher degree of certainty than their reasons actually permit. Now, this is really the old verification problem coming back again. I mean, this is still, uh, Wittgenstein is still saying, hey, you guys, if you want to be on the same level of science, you, you need to, to verify. You, you need to use scientific uh, method, but we don't. And so, so Wittgenstein's conclusion here is not that religious language is meaningless, but that religious language has a completely different function, completely different use from scientific language. Uh, another difference is that uh, religious language has a large emotional component. Uh, that is, when I say God exists, there's a lot of feeling connected with that, uh, uh, an allegiance, a love connected with that, that you don't typically have with scientific statements. Uh, further, religious statements tend to make belief or disbelief a moral issue. Uh, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, then you're going to hell, okay? As if it's a bad thing to disbelieve and a good thing to believe. And Wittgenstein says uh, 
Uh, scientists don't do that. I don't know if that's entirely true. Uh, I've heard scientists say terrible things about people who disbelieve in evolution. Uh, uh, another thing, uh, religious language regulates the conduct of people who use it. Remember how Immanuel Kant said that uh, uh, religious language is regulative, not constitutive? Well, uh, Wittgenstein says religious language always has a moral component to it. It always uh, has a, a, a component of governing uh, the way we act, the way we do things. So, he says, uh, religious language is radically different from scientific language. Uh, and therefore, uh, religious language must never be used to question scientific theories, like the theory of evolution, for example. A religious language is okay as long as you limit it to its own sphere. Uh, it has a unique use. It must be kept in its own compartment. And similarly, scientific language shouldn't be used in such a way as to try to refute religious language. Now, you know, this sounds kind of uh, original, kind of creative, but, uh, you know, a lot of people have written this way. A lot of people have said things like, uh, uh, the Bible and science belong to different spheres. Uh, science tells us what happened, and the Bible gives us the value of what happened, that kind of thing. That sounds richly in. Uh, and uh, so uh, a, a lot of people have, have done this. Even evangelicals sometimes do it, say science belongs to this sphere, religion belongs to this sphere, and so they never... Uh, uh, ought to conflict. You have the religion, uh, religious sphere, which tells you how to be saved from sin, and then you have the scientific sphere, which tells you how the world is made. And that would be fine, except that the Bible also tells us how the world was made. The Bible tells us some things about the creation of the world. The Bible tells us uh, some things about the way God, uh, the way the course of nature is governed by God's word. So it doesn't. Uh, the Bible does not. Uh, divide uh, our experience into two uh, uh, hermetically sealed compartments, one called the religious and one called the secular, although some people are putting a lot of emphasis uh, trying to renew that uh, distinction today. But uh, anyway, uh, 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 that's Wittgenstein. V Wittgenstein's usually considered to be especially bright and especially original and not like anybody else. But here he's using a, a formula which is... Uh, very common, you know, it goes back to Thomas Aquinas' uh, distinction between natural knowledge and uh, supernatural knowledge. Well, uh, that's, that's uh, Wittgenstein's view of religion, and of course I think it's uh, entirely uh, inadequate. I think that uh, religious language is comprehensive. Uh, I think religious language is very broad. Religious as somebody who belongs to a religion, the religion tells them how to live the rest of life in every sphere of life. And it's certainly true of Christianity. I think that's also true of uh, other religions. Uh, uh, whether your God is false or true, uh, that God makes a comprehensive claim on your life. In Christianity, we're told whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So uh, uh, our faith governs our, uh, our worship, but it also governs our business and our homemaking and our, our rest, our holidays, our f uh, child rearing, our studies uh, in uh, geography and history and science and all the different things. Our, our faith governs everything that we do. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, Wittgenstein is really distorting uh, the nature of religious language when he suggests that it can be confined uh, to one particular uh, orbit. Uh, just one other thing about the later Wittgenstein, his book called On Certainty. Uh, this is an interesting book. It follows uh, Charles Peirce, actually. If you go back there, uh, you find Peirce saying similar things. Uh, Wittgenstein... Uh, says there are two kinds of doubt. Now, Descartes, remember, said that we ought to, uh, as part of our method for gaining knowledge, we ought to, ought to try 
hard to doubt everything that it's possible to doubt, a universal doubt. Well, uh, Wittgenstein says there are two kinds of doubt and two kinds of knowledge. There's practical doubt that can be resolved by methods that are accepted in a particular language game that lead to practical knowledge. So if I'm, uh, uh, if I'm in doubt as to uh, uh, whether there are any forks in the drawer, I relieve, I relieve that doubt by opening the drawer and looking in there to see if there are some forks in there. That's practical doubt. Uh, that's doubt uh, uh, that can be resolved. There's a clear method for resolving it, and resolving that doubt uh, has a practical purpose. So uh, uh, the point is, uh, uh, is acting, uh, not seeing, but acting. Then on the other hand, there's doubt that is merely theoretical. Uh, like Descartes' doubt, you know, you try to doubt everything and you find that's very difficult to do. Uh, that would include, for some of his examples, uh, uh, doubt that I have two hands. Hold up your hands in front of you and then try real hard uh, to doubt that you have two hands. You, you can't do that. Doubt that other people exist uh, when you're looking at them. <laughs> that's pretty hard to do. Doubt that the world has existed more than five minutes. Uh, very hard to do, very hard to prove that it's existed more than five minutes. Uh, this kind of doubt, Wittgenstein says, is illegitimate because it uses terms like doubt outside of its ordinary context, outside of its language game. And therefore, when you relieve doubt and you call it knowledge, there are also two kinds of knowledge. Knowledge uh, used in the practical way uh, and knowledge that's merely theoretical. Uh, terms like doubt, believe, and know, uh, you should be using those within ordinary language. This is why we call it ordinary language philosophy. You should be using these in the context of ordinary language, uh, not uh, in some theoretical way. Now, epistemological theories, he says, often try to relieve theoretical doubt. But uh, since theoretical doubt is illegitimate, uh, these epistemological theories are useless because they stretch language beyond its limits. For example, you, you all know what I mean when I ask, uh, is it four o'clock? Four o'clock happens to be a time when I hope to end this lecture. Uh, is it four o'clock? Uh, you know what that question means and you're prepared to answer. Uh, now if I say, is it four o'clock on the sun? What would you say? Well, it stands to reason, doesn't it, that uh, if it's meaningful to ask, is it four o'clock uh, uh, in Orlando, Florida, and if it's meaningful to ask, is it four o'clock in London, England? It certainly ought to be meaningful to ask, is it four o'clock on the sun? <laughs> but as a matter of fact, we all know that it's not meaningful to ask, is it four o'clock on the sun? And if somebody says it is four o'clock on the sun or it's not four o'clock on the sun, what evidence could he bring? How could he verify it? See the the verification principle is not entirely dead uh, here. Uh, verification often comes in as a criterion of whether uh, language is being used meaningfully or not. So uh, uh, what evidence can be brought to bear uh, is not no stronger, he says, than the original assertion. Uh, if we question our basic certainties, certainties like um, the world has been here more than, more than five minutes, uh, then we're just questioning our whole way of life. Uh, but more to the point, we're asking meaningless questions. Uh, we're asking questions outside uh, our language game. And, uh, but now, how, how do we define the proper language game? How, how do we know that we're playing the right right language game. Uh, Wittgenstein says, usually it's something that we inherit. Um, intuition, uh, what would it be like to doubt that I have two hands and try to relieve that doubt? So you can ask 
questions like that uh, to show yourself whether you're on the right track, whether you're talking uh, meaningfully or whether you're uh, talking merely theoretically uh, in a way that's illegitimate. Uh, you know, Wittgenstein sometimes says it's like a car that's spinning its wheels, you know, uh, that's not getting any traction, that's, that's not moving anywhere. Uh, and, and that's what this theoretical kind of language uh, is, is about. But I keep asking, how do you know? I mean, uh, Wittgenstein would say that a lot of theology is just spinning your wheels. It's using uh, words in a theoretical way. And I say, why should I believe you, Wittgenstein? How do you know? How can you prove that to me? And uh, so we, we sort of reach an impasse at that point. Um, there's a little bit now. I, I, I'm hoping that as we move through the history of philosophy, you're making comparisons. Uh, think of Thomas Reed, for example. Thomas Reed, uh, who also took up this problem of uh, uh, how we know that other people exist. How do we know that the world has been here for more than five minutes? And Reed said, you just have to assume. You, you just have to. Uh, uh, it's just common sense. Uh, there's no way of proving it, but it's common sense to believe that other people have minds like I do and to believe that the world has been here for more than five minutes. So uh, we use common sense. And Wittgenstein is, is kind of a common sense philosopher here. He's kind of saying that uh, uh, we should stick to, to common language. Uh, see, there's always a linguistic twist here because it is the 20th century. We have to stick with common language. We have to stick with the, our common language games, uh, stick with our common practices in the use of language. Well, in the later Wittgenstein, there are many useful points about the richness of language. I think that uh, though that uh, even the later Wittgenstein is caught up in the rationalist, irrationalist dialectic. Under irrationalism, I would say he's uh, hostile to metaphysics, and uh, he wants to uh, uh, make you, uh, allow any use of language to be wide open, to give people freedom to use language any way they want to, and not to make judgments about whether language is meaningful or not. On the other hand, there's rationalism where he tries to show us what kind of language is meaningful and what kind of language is not. The critique of metaphysics rests on the notion of proper use. Uh, Wittgenstein tells us we have to use words in the proper way. But what is the proper way? Wittgenstein never defines that in general, um, except in a question-begging way, and all of uh, all our use of uh, language is made to conform to this notion, but the notion is so vague that it becomes a pretext for asserting prejudices. He doesn't like metaphysical language, and so he says that's not the proper way to use it. But what if I say, you know, Hegel was playing a language game too. You know, Hegel was uh, playing a game with his fellow philosophers <laughs> and with other people who read his, his, uh, his work. Uh, if there were any non-philosophers who read his work. But that's a, that's a game too, isn't it? That's a use. And we shouldn't be criticizing Hegel for using words in a, in a kind of way that's unusual to us, speaking a somewhat different language from the one that we, we speak. Uh, I think Wittgenstein uh, makes some useful points about the distinctiveness of religious language, how it's different from scientific and all. Uh, he makes some points that are not so useful, but religious language is distinctive not because it deals with some narrow, peculiar subject matter, nor because it's properly used only in certain restricted areas of life. Religious language is distinctive precisely because it is presuppositional and therefore demands authority over all of life. Uh, and I kind of agree with uh, Wittgenstein about certainty. Again, defining the language game is difficult. It's not obvious to me that general doubts or metaphysical doubts are always illegitimate. I think there's a useful function to be able to analyze this question, uh, do I have two hands? Uh, and, and if it's nonsensical, tell me why it's nonsensical. 
But these metaphysical games are also played, you see. Wittgenstein thinks it settles the discussion to say, well, the language game is played, and we have to reconcile ourselves to that. Well, uh, there, there are games that are played uh, that he doesn't seem to recognize the legitimacy of. Okay, I want to move on now. Uh, the later Wittgenstein takes us up until about Oh, 1960. Wittgenstein died, I think, about 52, but uh, his work was not widely distributed. See, when he died, he had published only only two things. He published the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, and he trans he published a little essay on ethics, which was more uh, more fits in with his early thinking than his later thinking published nothing in the very fruitful later phases of his career. Uh, if Wittgenstein had worked for a, a university with a publish or perish policy, uh, Wittgenstein would have been uh, fired uh, early in his career and never allowed to come back. But uh, everybody agrees that Wittgenstein is a genius, uh, one of the really formative thinkers, and so, you know, uh, uh, be flexible here. Recognize that some people can be very brilliant even if they don't uh, publish very much, and that, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's okay. Uh, you know, the academic establishment does not have the final word uh, on uh, who is important and who's not, and who's edifying and who's not uh, edifying. Uh, so, uh, uh, Wittgenstein's writing after he after he died, they 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 investigated all the shoe boxes that he had used to gather sayings and on different topics, and and some of them were labeled and some of them weren't. And very shortly afterward, there was a flood of books uh, with Wittgenstein listed as the author, and uh, for the next twenty twenty five years. Uh, these books keep came kept coming out uh, every couple of years. There would be a new Wittgenstein book on something or other, until uh, he became known as a very prolific author indeed. So uh, uh, he kept influencing more and more people, and I think the uh, the influence of the sec uh, of the later Wittgenstein continued all through the 60s and through the 70s and into the 80s, and then it began to fade a little bit. It still exists. People still refer to him all the time, and I, I think uh, Wittgenstein was probably the most important secular philosopher of the 20th century, probably the most influential uh, secular philosopher of the 20th century. 